So, um, so I'm going to begin by sort of like going elaborating on something that Ryan said yesterday. Um, so, we're um, sort of looking at the connections between lower bounds and algorithms, and particularly the connections between proving lower circuit lower bounds and um, and um, and derandomization um, is what I'm supposed to be doing. But I'm going to make a little digression. Say like maybe when we look about algorithms involving circuits, we can group them into two categories. And this is kind of implicit in what Ryan was talking about yesterday. So saying the circuit analysis category, you're given a circuit C, and you want to know what can you say about the function the circuit computes. Okay. And we can talk about inverse circuit analysis. In inverse circuit analysis, you're given a function, and you're trying to say, what can we say about the circuits that compute that function? Okay. So one example that Ryan mentioned yesterday was, is the minimum circuit size problem. Given a truth table for a function, compute the, size, the minimum size circuit for f. Okay. So that's one example of inverse circuit analysis. And just as like, we'd be happy with any kind of circuit, you know, um, any kind of circuit analysis algorithms. Maybe we'd be happy with a much weaker inverse circuit analysis algorithm. And you could think of, um, and, and I guess the, the thesis of Rosborough and Rudish was that such an inverse algorithm, such an inverse um, circuit analysis algorithm is implicit in most of the known lower bounds. Okay. So what do we mean by that? So, um, so let's, you know, here we're talking, what, what is a kind of generic um, inverse circuit analysis problem? Okay. So um, it's just a property of the truth table of a Boolean function that a, a Boolean function might have or not. But it should have something to do with the circuit complexity of that function. Okay. So, um, so they um, gave three axioms um, or three conditions that a property could have. Um, and these, these conditions, actually, they have a lot of knobs on them uh, that, that can be moved to, to fit a variety of circumstances. I'm just going to pick one setting of the knobs. Okay. So. Um, Say that it's um, polynomial time. Um, shoot, now I'm forgetting what their names were. Constructive? Be constructive if given f, we can tell in, poly in polynomial time um, whether f has the property. And one note I want to make here is that polynomial time, since the input is the whole true table for f, is really exponential time in the um, input size to the function f. Okay, so if f is a Boolean circuit on n input bits, then uh, polynomial time means time 2 to the order n. Okay. Um, then. Uh, a second property that would be nice to have is that it has something to do with the circuit complexity of the function, and in particular is a way of proving that the function is hard. So if pi of f holds, this is called being useful. And here, technically, I'm saying it's useful against polynomial size circuits. Then um, if pi of f is true, then the circuit's complexity of f is at least a super polynomial, some super polynomial function. Okay. And again, we, we can put in all sorts of knobs, uh, say certain classes of function of circuits here, and um, certain quantitative bounds that, that we may be more demanding. Okay. Um, and the last condition is the one that we're going to be sometimes using and sometimes not, but let's 
go with their traditional approach to start with called largeness. It says that it isn't true that almost, you know, that almost nothing has this property. So the probability over a random f that pi of a random function f is at least um, uh, is at most exponentially small uh, in, in the input size. Okay, and this is this is this was chosen because all their theorems hold even if it's only this small. I think intuitively you would think that a, a property that would that would come out of a circuit lower bound would hold for almost all random functions, not just non-negligible fraction of such functions. But all the theorems that they proved about these properties were also true with just this weakest, weak largeness condition. Um, OK, so any questions about this definition? So they did two remarkable things. The first thing is they observed um, that if one-way functions exist, uh, one-way functions, yeah. I'd like to have a question. Uh, line A, how do I pass the last possible? So we can test the property in polynomial time, or can we test if the property is in polynomial time? The rest? No, no, no. no. The, we can yeah. test in P whether pi of f was. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 okay. Or I could say, I'm not, maybe I, I was confusing two things. So you can either say pi itself is in P, which means that we can test whether pi holds in, poly, in, in polynomial time. Um, okay, so... Um, where f is given as a truth table. So this means um, 2 to the order n time. So let me just say. Oh, yeah, length of that. The length of the truth table for f. It's a truth table, not a pot. Yeah. yeah, this is, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it is a parenthetical remark. <laughs> so it needs another. Okay. So is this, is this, is this clear now? Okay. So they show that if cryptographic one way functions exist, well, then you get cryptographic pseudorandom generators. Then you get um, cryptographic pseudorandom function generators. And what a pseudorandom function generator is, is a way of constructing easy to compute functions that look like random functions. And if it looks like a random function, it should, it sh you know, this largeness condition says non with non negligible probability, it should have the property. Some of them should have the property. But since they're easy to compute, all of them have small circuit complexity, and that can contradicts uh, usefulness. So actually, it's very likely, you know, they have a very interesting notion of um, natural property, and uh, it's very likely, though, that their definition is the empty set. <laughs> um, these properties don't exist. Okay. So... Um, Okay, but um, but it's still it's still a very interesting notion. But you know because you can like play with the knobs and say you know this may be true for general circuits, but for the kinds of circuits that we have lower bounds for, there are such properties, and the they're implicit in the proofs. The properties are implicit in the proofs of lower bounds. Okay, so I'm going to leave this up, although maybe, can I move it to the other side? Let me try doing that, see if it works. Wow. 
<laughs> okay. So, um, because we'll be referring to the same complexity class classes this time. Okay. So, um, here's an. So they they probably don't exist, but we haven't ruled it out. Cryptograph cryptography might be impossible. Um, what's the what's the connection with with um, de-randomization. Okay, so let me just give. Um, uh, so remember, so we've been looking at um, probabilistic algorithms with potentially two-sided error, but uh, another class of algorithms that would be really interesting to have are error-free probabilistic algorithms. They're, sometimes they don't run fast enough. Um, and that's where the, the choice of randomness matters. But when they give you an answer, it's a correct answer. That class is called ZP. Okay. And um, so this is a little bit informal because it's about promise problems and so on. But um, here's something that's, that's not too, too hard to show, although it uses the machinery of de-randomization. If there is a natural property then the circuit approximation problem that we've been talking about, the one that's hard for BPP, would be in zero error probabilistic time um, 2 to the n to the epsilon for every epsilon. Okay, And here's why. Um, so remember the, the diagram that we had on in Tuesday's lecture, or maybe you don't remember, so I'm going to write it down again. Okay. And that's we had a generic way of taking a, fu a function f and mapping it to a pseudorandom generator, g sub f. And the harder f was, the, the smaller the seeds for the pseudorandom generator were. And then we said any, any way of breaking uh, g to the f, distinguishing it from random, gives us a small circuit for, for f in the other direction. So, um, okay. And we have to use the kind of low-end version of this for the way I've stated it because the natural property just guarantees that you have super polynomial hardness, not um, like exponential hardness. So that's just a note for people who know these things. Otherwise, you can just ignore that. OK. Uh, so I mean, um, so solving the G randomness distinguishing problem with uh, like 55% chance of success. So if you can tell the difference between the, the range of G and random strings and, and guess which whether you're, you're in the range, from the range, or from a, a random string with more than, say, 55% chance of being correct, then you can use such an algorithm to construct this circuit C sub F. You can use, a, say, any circuit that does this, solves this distinguishing problem to create the circuit C sub f. Okay. So, um, so here's how we're going to solve the, the CAP problem. Okay. So um, we're going to, uh, so say that we want to estimate, there's going to be a, a number of circuits flying around. So let's say we're going to estimate some circuit that I'm just going to call D because it's the letter after C. Because we already have some C's there. So we want to estimate the probability over X that D of X is 1. What we're going to do is, um, so the, say, this, say D run, you know, has, a, has T gates, then um, we're going to pick 
you know, this we have a guarantee of usefulness that's n to the omega one. We're going to pick um, an n so that this n to the omega one function is significantly bigger than t. Okay, but that means that means that n as t grows is going to be t to the little o of one. Okay, so. Um, Maybe I should have put a t here. t is like the size of the input. It would make it clearer. Okay. So then we pick a random function on, uh, on n bits. Okay. Um, and we're going to hope that it's a hard function. Moreover, we're going to hope that we know why it's hard. So we uh, test whether pi of f holds, and that's in time 2 to the little n. If it does, we know that f is at least this hard. And so we, we if so, we construct g sub f and run d of x for every x in the range of g sub f. Okay. okay. And you can see that, you know, the, the seeds to g sub f are about n, n bits long, a little bit more. So we have to actually, like, um, uh, but polynomially related to to this n, and um, the uh, um, and so the the time uh, taken by this algorithm, we have to like test whether this holds. That's going to be about two to the n time, or polynomial in two to the n time, so two to the order n time. Constructing g sub f is also going to take about two to the n time. Um, and running d sub x, the number of outputs of, of, of the pseudorandom generator is going to be 2 to some polynomial in n. Okay. So all of this procedure takes time 2 to the polynomial in n, and n is little, o, um, is little t to the little o of 1. So the total time this algorithm takes is 2 to the t to the little of 1. So that's the time. It's a, a probabilistic algorithm in that we have to pick f, but um, we want to claim that whenever we produce an answer, so we might not produce an answer because f might not have this property, and that way we just give up, but there's a, a non-negligible chance that f has the property from the largeness, and if so, then, um, then we're guaranteed that this circuit D cannot solve the, we know that F has, has, if pi holds, F has hardness, which means this thing doesn't exist, which means that there's no T step algorithm that breaks G sub F. In which case, when we run D sub X on all of the range of, of G, we'll get ex very close to the right answer. Okay. So I'm leaving my hands a bit, but, but hopefully the idea is is somewhat clear. So it uses the machinery that we talked about, we didn't really do on uh, Tuesdays. Um, any questions about this? Okay. Well, we said that these properties don't exist, probably, because if we, we believe in cryptography, they don't exist. What kind of weak, you know, so if we want something that might also, you know, some other related property that might have both u utility in circuit complexity and in de-randomization, um, what, what might we drop, well, of these conditions to, to weaken it, to, to give it more of a chance of existing? Well... At least, you know, to have it be an inverse analysis algorithm, we want it to be an algorithm, and we want it to be relatively efficient. So I don't think we want to like, change constructivity. 
Okay. Um, how about usefulness? Well, if we drop usefulness altogether, it'll be useless. It'll be useless. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we won't be able to conclude anything about things having the property. How about largeness? Well, seems like, you know, intuitively a random function should be the hardest, so largeness makes sense as far as like a heuristic about our, our proofs, but at least it's conceivable. It makes sense, it would also make sense to have a useful a constructive property where largeness didn't exist up to a point. Um, what is that point? We want it not to be empty. Because <laughs> like the empty property still is not very good for us. <laughs> okay. So, um, so let me go and say like it's not it's no longer natural. But um, so we need our, uh, a new new notion. So I'm going to call it um, quasi-natural. If we replace C uh, with Oh, I'm going to need that again. Non-emptiness. So, um, just saying that this probability is greater than zero, i.e., um, that there always exists such a function. Yes? What about relaxing usefulness to sort of work, like approximate usefulness, or do we get anything uh, so what would it mean? You mean if you want to be useful against BBP or something instead of... Yeah. So we can like define usefulness against like smaller classes of circuits. That's still interesting. We could define it as like usefulness in... Uh, I mean, we could increase the notion of usefulness maybe to say there's no circuit that approximates it, but that actually makes it stronger. Um, and then maybe like no semi-uniform. If you, if you had a probabilistic notion of useless, like almost surely it's it's useful. Yeah. That's the null property is almost surely useful. That's true. Yeah. Or I'm mean, I, I gonna say not the null property, the the opposite of the null property. Yeah, the opposite, right? Yeah. The the, 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 the just accept everything. Yeah. That, that's right. So we know most functions are are hard. So, like, heuristic useful, we could just say yes. Okay. So, um, so I encourage people to look at variants of this, but I'm not going to talk about all of them today. <laughs> I'm going to talk about several variants of this today, but not every single possible one. Okay. So now, this, you know, we've dropped this. Actually, the, the cryptographic impossibility no longer applies because, um, because, you know, you say, okay, well, still, we can't tell, um, we can't tell uh, a pseudorandom function from a random function, but a random function almost certainly doesn't have the property, possibly, and the pseudorandom function might not have the property, might never have the property. No contradiction. Okay. So, um, okay. So, Let's think about what um, what kind of properties are p-constructive in this sense um, and non-empty, and then just like think about whether what it would mean for them to be useful. So let's like keep condition A and C for a while. Just think about this in the abstract. 
see where such properties land in this kind of hierarchy, and then like say now what it would mean, what would it mean for them to be also useful? Okay. So, um, so a property of a of a truth table, you know, the truth table for function is just a string of length two to the n. Okay. You can think of it just as strings of a certain length. Okay. If it's not exactly a power of two, you can round up or round down and interpret it as you as you as you see. So just like a property that's non-empty and constructive just means that for every n there exists some f so that um, y of f is true. Okay. So um, uh, so we're going to have like a total functions in NP interest group. So for people in the who will be in the total functions in NP interest group, you can think of this is exactly um, total functions in non-deterministic exponential time. <coughs> because here, sort of the the search problem that always is possible is to find an f so that pi of f. Okay, and just like so, TFNP are search problems for NP problems that are always poly, always have a solution. So search problems that always have a solution. And here the input is n. So in exponential time, we can evaluate whether whether f is a possible solution. Okay. And uh, so TFNP is just a little, is between, TFNP is a little bit between NP intersect co NP and NP, and it's much closer to NP intersect co NP than it is to NP in some formal sense. Okay. Um, or informal sense, maybe not a formal sense. <laughs> In my thinking, it's, I think of it as much closer to NP intersect co NP. Okay. So, um, so the class that we're defining is in between NX intersect co NX and um, NX, um, and uh, is is uh, yeah. sandwiched in between these two. But I think of it as much closer to the bottom than it is to the top. So any questions about this? Okay, but since it's very related to NX to intersect co NX, maybe and you know maybe we can think about. Okay, okay. So let me actually say, back up a minute, and say so. Another here's another way of thinking about the, these type of problems. So, um, we we'll go back and, and look at natural natural properties as well. With the largeness condition, they're also interesting in this in this way. Um, what this means is that you have some kind of object, and you have a kind of guarantee or proof that that object always exists. Something with the so you have like a property, and you're guaranteed that something with that property always exists. Just that's just restating. Okay, and you have some way of verifying that property. Okay, so we have lots of problems where, you know, we want to construct something that has a certain property, and we have some non-constructive proof that there is something with that property. So, I like take an expander graph. Um, it's easy to see that a random graph is an expander graph, but it's relatively hard to actually come up with a constructive expander graph. Okay, so um, so um, the and so you, and then you think of the natural properties, the ones that have a non-negligible chance. Those are the properties that you can prove something exists by the probabilistic method without any um, subtleties, you know, like um, using um, Lovash local lemma. <laughs> Okay, maybe now it's even with the Lovash local lemma. 
because you have the constructive proof. Okay, so um, can't see something with overwhelming probability. So anyway, so so lots of things we can. So anything where we have this kind of um, constructive um, argument, you know, sorry, probabilistic argument, but not a constructive argument. Um, that's that's uh, a natural property in some sense. Or so let me say that's a, a property with p constrictivity and largeness. And then when is it natural? When is it useful? It's when there's no actual simple construction to be had. Okay. If there's a simple construction, that's gonna that simple construction is gonna be a small circuit that determines, that describes the object in question, most of the time. You know, that's a, a good notion of what a constructive construction of the object is. It's a small circuit that implicitly describes the, the, the object. It's a rule that says when two vertices have an edge between them, for example, in the case of expanders. So, um, so the existence of a natural property would say, here's something, I know things exist by the probabilistic method, um, but there is no way of constructing them, period. Not that I don't know how to construct them, there's no simple construction, period. Okay. So that's natural property. Uh, if we drop largeness, it's just that instead of, we just drop the condition, there's something that we know how to construct, we know exists by the probabilistic method, we just crossed out by the probabilistic method. Here's some kind of class of objects that we know how to, that we know exists, but there is no simple construction. Okay. Um, and so, um, so like, so the question is, is um, so we're saying is any property i in TFNE useful? The saying is is there any is equivalent to saying is there uh, an inherently non-constructive Um, existence proof. And I guess technically, you know, to be an existence proof, I not only it's not only that pi uh, is in TFNP that we are actually able to prove that pi is in TFNP in some system. But um, we, if it's true but not provable, we could always adopt it as an axiom. <laughs> okay. So, so this clears so this kind of subtle point. So this is, a, this is actually where we started thinking about easy witness, uh, at least two, two of us. I don't know if Valentin was thinking this way. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. So, okay, where's the connection to, um, to circuit complexity and where's the, you know, the somewhat like implicit connection to circuit complexity, because we're talking about things that are useful for circuit complexity, but where's the connection to like proving fun particular functions have, have large circuits, and what's the connection to derandomization? I'm gonna give you like the, the easy directions, and then the, the easy witness is, is like generalizing in a, in a way that makes it much harder, but also more useful. So let's just take this argument and say, well, what if there's a quasi-natural property? What do we have to change? Problem is, so what, uh, what word do we have to eliminate in the description of the algorithm? Random. Random. Because a random one's not going to have the property now. Okay. So how can we pick something how can we pick something non-randomly when, when there's just few solutions? So we have to change the model of computation. 
So instead of picking it randomly, how can we pick it non-deterministically? <coughs> so pick non-deterministically uh, a function f on n bits. And the rest of the algorithm stays the same. And, but then the because we're changing the model, the conclusion becomes different. We have to change one letter in the statement. Which letter? Z, Z disappears and it gets replaced by yeah. N. Actually, I guess ZP disappears N time. Okay. Otherwise, it's exactly the same argument. Okay. So, um, so there, there's the connection with derandomization. We, we don't know that BPP is in non-deterministic time, uh, and um, this would this would say that some non-trivial, non-deterministic derandomization of BPP is possible if such things exist. Now, do we believe that such things exist? We didn't believe that um, actual natural properties exist, but I say there's actually a good reason to believe that uh, these quasi-natural properties exist. Let me give you uh, a reason to believe. Okay. Um, as I said, TFNE is just a little bit above NX intersect colon X, or NE intersect colon E. So here's what I'm going to claim. Actually, it's, it's, it's you know, I claim it, and then the proof is just going to be like one line. Okay. So um, if any intersect colony e is not contained in p slash poly, then there are quasi-natural properties. Um, and I'm going to try to switch the boards around. No, they don't go that that way. Okay. So I think I'll have to erase. I think this board has actually served its purpose now. So we can erase this diagram. Whenever I say that, I'll need it the next thing. So um, the proof is, OK, we need to construct a, a property. So what is a problem in nx? A problem in nx means that for every instance of length n, uh, you know, something's in nx intersect colon x means that if something is in the language L, so you know, let L be in any intersect colon e, L not in p slash poly, and here's how we're going to get the property. Okay, so that means there's like an exponentially long witness w sub x that x is in L, and you can verify that witness in polynomial time in the length of the witness. So an exponential time in x means polynomial time in the length of the witness. But if x is not in L, since it's also in co any, if x is not in L, there there's a witness. W prime of x, that um, that x is in the complement, and it has the same kind of properties. So here's going to be the the property. Okay, pi is going to be of f is going to be true if f has the following form. It's um, you know a list of all two to the n x's, and for each either a witness that x is in the language or a witness that x is not in the language. Okay? Um, and, and say like the bit, just so that we can know what we're, we're talking about, um, the bit um, is x in the language. Um, okay, so why is this um, constructive? Well, Remember, the, the, it's constructive in the input size. The input size is 2 to the n times 2 to the order n. Okay? 
And what we have to do is, in that amount of time, go through and verify each of these witnesses. See which way it's supposed to be, and then verify that it, that is a witness for that direction. So it's, it's polynomial time in the input size, which is huge. Okay. Um, why is it uh, not empty? Well, witnesses always exist. There may be multiple witnesses. It might not be uniquely defined, but it's always non-empty. And the final condition is it should be large. Why should it be large? Say we had a small circuit. What was the contradiction? That small circuit would be computing the witnesses for every x, each bit of the witnesses, but would also be computing these b sub x's, which just tells you whether x is in the language. So you just restrict the circuit to just give the b sub x and ignore the rest of the part, and that would be a small circuit for L. So if we had a small description of this whole mess, we'd in particular have a small description of the truth table of F uh, of L, which we're, and we're assuming L is not in P slash poly. I should probably say it's not like L is not infinitely off in P slash poly, but I'm, I'm going to brush that kind of detail under the rug here in many ways. Um, I promised Valentin that I would start lying at some point. <laughs> and uh, I might as well start now. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this is clear. So that's actually kind of a, you know, I think it's quite likely that NX intersect column next is not in P slash poly. It doesn't, you know, that everything, not just at exponential time, but at non deterministic exponential time, intersect co non deterministic exponential time, isn't have a polynomial size circuit. So I believe that these properties really exist. Okay. But um, just in case um, they don't exist, this is not the this is sort of an analog of the easy witness lemma for NX intersect co NX. Um, just in case they don't exist, um, I'm gonna like look at uh, even further weakening weakening. Uh, and it just says, uh, I don't even have a name. Uh, like maybe barely natural <laughs> is the best name for it. It's not really that close to, to being natural. It just says, going to drop that it's always non-empty and replace it with occasionally non-empty. And actually, I'm going to also drop always useful and say occasionally useful. The, the one thing I was going to say is it has to be infinitely often useful and non-empty at the same time. So you can't alternate. <laughs> Here it's empty, so it's useful. <laughs> Here, you know, I guess every time it's empty, it's by default useful. <laughs> um, but um, I only want to count the ones that are not empty. Say infinitely many of those are actually useful. Okay. Okay. So. Um, okay. So we said that, sort of like. Um, the uh, you know this relates nx intersect co nx to whether there's a quasi natural property. What's the what's the corresponding thing for um, barely natural properties? Uh, and so this is the I'm actually able to like state the uh, the theorem that I'm supposed to be talking about now. Easy witness <coughs> lemma says that fairly natural, and this is actually like a, a version due to Ryan, but um, fairly natural properties exist if and only if um, any. 
is not contained in Well, you proved that it's equivalent, yeah, this, just like to move the property around. <laughs> this, yeah. Otherwise, I have to give some more definitions. <laughs> uh, okay. So let me try to give the, a sketch of how we prove it. And unfortunately, it's a little less direct than the, um, the version for NX intersect co NX. So, um, but, not, but it's not so bad. And it just uses one of these shelf collapsed arguments. Just a little bit convoluted one. Okay. So, um, uh, So in, let's assume, so I think the, the hard implication is to say, say that we've got, okay, I guess maybe I'll do the easy implication first. So say that barely natural properties don't exist. Then what that's saying is really, okay, so one, one observation is that we can sort of like get, for an NE language, we can give every input its own length. So, um, so what this means is that whenever we have a relation between X and W, if W exists, and here W is exponentially long, but verifiable in exponential time, which means polynomial time in the size of W. If W exists, there exists a, a, a small circuit um, so that C um, computes W. So C at input I is the ith bit of W. Implicitly represents the circuit. Okay? So that's like saying this is the property is it a witness for X? And um, it's not useful. So therefore, there is a, if there is a witness, um, there is a succinctly describable one. Okay. Um, and uh, the size of C is n to the order 1. Okay. So, um, Instead of searching for W, if we want to solve this problem, instead of searching for W, um, we search for C. Okay. So, um, and then in exponential time, verify C. So the circuit is producing, the, uh, over all its inputs, is producing the bits of the witness. So what, what have you assumed in order to... Say that you've assumed nothing. So this is so we're saying barely prop, barely natural properties don't exist. The property of being a witness is constructive, uh, and we're assuming it exists. So uh, so it's not empty. Uh, so if it ex if it's constructive and not empty, and we don't get a useful property, we don't get a barely natural property, then it's not useful. So that means that there is a way of writing it as a circuit. And so we search for C um, instead of W. So we run in exponential time, 2 to the n to the order 1, rather than in, in uh, doubly exponential time. So um, this shows that NE is contained in um, exponential time here. And this is like, uh, yeah. So if, if these don't exist, any is contained in exponential time. And then the other thing that you can see is that also exponential time, in this case, is uh, contained in p slash poly. Why? Because if not, the truth table 
for an exponential time problem, just like we did with the NE intersect cohen If not, the truth table for that exponential time problem is itself a natural property. Not in P slash poly is itself uh, a quasi-natural property. And that's very similar to the dilemma about NX finner set colon X. But I'm running out of time, so I'm not, or I already ran out of time, so I'm not going to actually give the details. So, um, and so together, say any is contained in X, and X is in P slash poly, so any is contained in P slash poly, which is what we wanted to prove. Okay. And the other direction is, is, is more roundabout. But, um, if we use the same kind of construction with this barely natural property, we just have to, like, change a little bit, um, So, so the first thing is saying, like, assume there's a barely natural property. So then, if we use the same construction, but just sometimes it messes up completely, well, we, because we're, we're trying to look for a function that, that, that in a set that doesn't exist, that's empty, um, what we still get is that CAPP is in infinitely often um, non determinate sub X, okay, uh, with a bit of advice, which I'm just going to ignore. I couldn't bring myself to completely lie, but, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to lie, but I'm going to tell you where, that I'm lying. <laughs> okay, so you basically get a similar result, containment of CAP. And you say, like, when it works, it only works sometimes, but when it works, it gives you a de-randomization in non deterministic sub-exponential time. Okay. And then um, the next thing that we'll, we see is that, well, now we do the shelf collapse. Either X is in P slash poly or not, just like we always do. If X is n so, if X is not um, in P slash poly, certainly non deterministic X is not in P slash poly, and we're done. So the the thing we have to worry about is that X might be in P slash poly. Okay. But now, if X is in P slash poly, we already saw that then X equals Merlin Arthur time. And since cap is in non-deterministic uh, sub-exponential time, this is in uh, combining the non-determinism move and the probabilistic check with just the non-determinism, this is in non-deterministic sub-exp. And here I am lying. OK? Because um, it's a little more complicated. Okay. But now, X is in non deterministic sub X, and that means that something strictly stronger than X is in non deterministic X when you scale that up. Okay? So, so when we scale this up, we see that, um, say, time 2 to the n to the omega 1 for some omega 1 function. Is in is contained in non deterministic exponential time, but looking at the Kanan argument, said okay in in this amount of time we can directly diagonalize and get um, uh, something not with with large circuits. So this we can say directly um, by the Kanan argument is not in p slash poly. So something that's not in p slash poly is contained in non-exp, 
i.e. an act is not in P such poly. And I lied at a, var a variety of points, so, <laughs> but that's the non idea. Not X, but, oh, I see, but any in that non X. Right. You don't care the difference there. And so, Mark Oak doesn't get a chance to ask his technical question because I lied too much. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so that sort of like says that. In some sense, um, you know, some variety, you know, Rosbrough Rudis said that heuristically natural properties are, are what we use to prove circuit lower bounds. And this is saying, in some sense, some variety of natural property is necessary and sufficient to prove circuit lower bounds. Exactly what we use. And note that this is the statement of this does not involve randomized algorithms at all. But in proving it, um, we ended up using um, even like the, you know, de-randomization, uh, you know, all the constructions of, of pseudo-random generators from, from hard functions that were implicit um, in the, in, in this, uh, What's the cap? In, in this step, yeah, where we put cap in. Okay. So, um, so that's another kind of example of the strands of spaghetti merging and getting stuck together. Um, saying the, if you're, we said before, if you're interested in uniform models, you still have to understand circuits. And now we're saying, to, if you just want to be, prove, do circuit complexity, you have to understand randomness. Or at least it seems like it's coming out of nowhere and uh, appearing. So, um, okay. And then I think Ryan, in his talk, is actually going to be using this at some point. Uh, I hope. Something like this. I'm definitely going to refer to it in the next talk. I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, oh, I did want to like so you know, leave with an open problem. Um, the open problem um, said, okay, you know, like to understand this whole mess, we had to go all the way up to non-deterministic exponential time. And this question of whether there's a barely natural property is, is a question about whether search problems at non-deterministic exponential time are kind of simpler than search problems at, at the NP level. Okay, because you know an NP, you wouldn't expect the witness for an NP problem to have any particular structure or be describable by a small circuit. They can be arbitrary, but for NE, what kind of what is NE anyway? So um, NE you can think of as your favorite NP problem, translated for a special class of instances that have succinct descriptions. Okay, and um, in one one uh, such class is, you know, you can like do the logical version where the succinct description is some kind of in circuit that implicitly represents the input, and we're comparing it against circuits that implicitly rep represent the witness. But you can be very much more concrete if you, in, uh, in, in your notion of succinct description. Okay? So one, um, a lot of NP-complete problems are, say, if you look at like one tape Turing machines as your machine model, you can see that a lot of the NP hard problems like independent set or so on are NE hard on, um, on graphs with the following kind of, when you're given the following kind of implicit description. You have like a, a very small graph and then some kind of graph product and GN, the, the grid, uh, N by N grid, okay? And this is really like the number of time steps your algorithm takes, and this represents the finite control of, of your Turing machine, okay? So this, you know, solving your favorite, your favorite NP-complete problem 
on graphs with this kind of simple description is uh, is any uh, complete. And here, what I mean is h is given explicitly, and then g sub n is just given by the number n. Okay, and that's what makes it n e because you have to actually to write down the graph it, itself is is exponential time. So, um, so the general kind of question is, what can we say about either the exact or um, fixed parameter? Complexities of such succinctly describable instances. So it's a very vague problem. Uh, I will not give an explicit dollar amount because it's so vague, but just in general refer. Um, submissions to the committee. <laughs> case by case basis. So, but is the, the, the kind of idea clear? To a couple of people. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's it. Then, then trigger the, the, the reserve. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then, then we get even a natural property because then uh, the minimum circuit size problem becomes polynomial time. Even yeah. Because you know, the minimum. Okay. I should have said minimum size circuit property is sort of the ideal natural property because it. It's useful at all levels, it's and you, only if you can keep the compute. Only if you can actually compute it. Only if you can put it in P. Yes, if you could put it in P, it would be the ideal natural property. So, I guess I mean that you know suggests the question. That the, I mean, we want, we like things in P. How much do you have to increase yeah. that first one if you kept some of the other things? Right. So I mean, they talk about quasi polynomial time. And it would have many of the same consequences. And again, it would be a trade off between uh, how strong you had as a pseudo random generator, um, how, um, how, what kind of size bound you wanted it to be useful for, um, which ones are possible. No, I would which, right. So there's a, the, those three can be traded off quantitatively. So I, I seem to recall some. Some work mentioning non, you know, like uh, NP version. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, Stephen has a, a kind of strange paper called uh, like hemi bits, semi bits, demi bits, and NP super bits, <laughs> uh, and uh, any natural proofs. <laughs> and you have to, yeah. Okay. But that's. Uh, I am not qualified to talk about that paper. <laughs> I'm not even qualified to say the name. 